Whereas if we look at Arna's deck, what you've got there is Arceus or Urshifu or Beedrill. Hey, there's a Zapdos in there. Hey, there's a Flygon. You know, let's not forget we've got, and actually in terms of consistency, we've got the, the trinity there of Crobat and Luminion and Oranguru. <laughs> it's a great combination of cards for sure. And uh, not many archetypes are using the likes of these Crobats and Luminions. I feel like they're sneaking into more and more decks because people do just want to have those more consistent turn one um, plays. And with the help of Quick Ball and Ultra Ball, they have a slightly better time here as we are getting to scout some prize cards. Yeah, the prizes don't look too bad. Arna's missing a 1-1 a one -one line there of Arceus, which is not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. And we saw that the Mew deck there had had, you know, one Genesect, one double turbo energy. Nothing that's really going to terrify them. There's nothing I look at those prizes and go, oh, that is going to make a big impact. Yeah, sometimes when you look at that sparkle, and especially if Kyman's the player going second, that's going to be a big card that he's going to be looking for, one of his other prize cards. But we'll have to wait and see here. I do feel like Arna is in a much more commanding position if he's able to go first in this game. Arceus decks typically do a much better job as player one. But in this case, it looks like Kaiwin is going to be kicking us off here and has a Battle VIP pass, oh. not a bad start. you love to see it, Joe. Battle VIP pass coming out lets you get yourself two basic Pokemon. You can only use it on your first turn, but it's so good on your first turn. It's one of those weird cards that, you know, it, it, you don't often want to play them because they're so situational, but they're so good. And then we see, you know, these Mew decks, because they're playing things, you know, Cramomatic forces you to discard an item card when you play it. Well, if you've got item cards in your hand that literally serve actually no purpose anymore, yeah. They're pretty good discard fodder. Yeah, downside, what downside? Let's just cram a matic <laughs> this guy and uh, get rolling, especially if you can hit that head. There's also a Rose Tower in the hand for Kaiwen. Um, it's a fantastic stadium card in that early game uh, to use pre your Genesex, because if you hit even more Pokemon, you get additional value uh, from your Fusion Strike system from Genesex. It obviously gets more and more powerful as a draw engine the more basic Pokemon you put into play that have Fusion Strike tags on them. So it's a fantastic start already here for Kaiwen. No, this is a very, very nice start indeed. You know, free Genesect out, and then you're playing that Rotom foam. Another VIP. You love to see it. Look <laughs> at this. A phone combination oh. is fantastic alongside. I think it's even the Rose Tower here. A yeah. crazy start. He's even got the energy drop onto Mew here. He can easily establish a second Mew as well on the board with this VIP pass coming down. And then he has the choice of whether he wants to go Meloetta or Oracorio, but a fantastic turn one. Absolutely. I mean, it basically just lets you look at the top five cards of your deck and just fix your top card. Wow. And when you're playing Rose Tower to draw a card, you grab that. You can have a full bench. We've already got one Mew out. We've now got three Genesect on the bench. It looks like we're going Mew and Meloetta. And that's it. That's the entire board. Kaiwin is playing a, a deck which is basic Pokemon, and then you evolve the Mew next turn. All Kaiwin really needs here is just a bunch of basic Pokemon. And they've literally been able to look through their deck and go, these are the exact six Pokemon I want in play. Yay, now I have them. And in a minute, Arna's probably going to get to go and start their turn. But right now, Kaiwin is having a great time. And of course, now Genesect, it's drawing until you've got six cards in hand because there are six Fusion Strike Pokemon. But there's three Genesect. So you're drawing until you've got six cards in hand three times and we could it depends how far Kaiwen wants to go here but we could see a huge amount of draw I mean we've already got an energy and a choice bout on the Mew realistically what more do you even want here yeah this is at this point you just set up for the following turn I think uh, looking towards like a boss's orders play for turn two is something that he'll try and uh, get already prepped in the hand try and get himself towards a V max for turn two to have the most aggressive turn possible uh, so you can go chasing down targets that Arna's putting into play but yeah all things considered it's a Fantastic start, and he's still got more Genesect to go. I think he's also holding on to Rotom Phone for his final Genesect. There's Boss's Orders coming to the top here. The VIP pass, although it is turn one, the board is full, so that's no longer a playable card. I imagine we're going to see one of these Rotom Phones get fired off for that final Genesect here. Yeah, there we go. I think something like Ultra Ball would be a great pickup here. Sparkle, not a bad option, but can be a bit of a brick in hand. These actually aren't the best cards. Maybe you just go second choice belt here, or just hold switch to have an option in hand that's net like a decent burnable here. Um, possibly scared of like tool removal if you take the choice belt, but no, that seems to be the most reasonable take here. Not ideal of that last Rotom phone. Uh, Kaiman actually has another one in hand, so he could just go for a re-roll here if he really wanted to. <laughs> or I think it's probably best to keep his last Rotom phone uh, for turn two. As you said, he's pretty much done everything he wants here. I'd love to see a retreat into the next Mew, just in case there's a Beedrill coming out. Uh, oh my goodness, he passes with the double turbo active. 
If we could see a mustard here, he could get massively punished. We could see. It is with his There's two Ultra Balls in hand and Air Balloon. We're going to see a turn one mustard here, and the Beedrill can take a two prize KO. Why was there no retreat from Kaiwin? Oh my goodness, all you need to do is, so the way Mustard works, you've got to have an empty hand, you play Mustard as the only card in your hand, you get to search your deck for a Pokemon, a, a single strike Pokemon, put it onto your bench, and then draw five cards. You put an energy on the Beedrill, and you oh, are this off. Is crazy. And we know that Arna plays Luminion. One of the things that, well, what Luminion really does is search out your supporters. And hey, if you've got a hyper-specific supporter that you need at the perfect time, like Rapid Strike, the single strike Mustard, sure would be nice if you could grab it with Luminion, and we know it's not prized. So, and there's a Beedrill in My hand. Goodness. I think it's just there. I think we're all groovy. I there's Air might. Balloon in hand for the Urshifu. He can take this Urshifu just to thin it out of the deck with his Ultra Ball, because he's got enough playables. The only thing that could possibly go wrong for him would be if he doesn't draw into another Grass Energy from um, the Mustard, because you still need to attach your Beedrill, of course. Yes, of course. Um, and that can only happen post-Mustard. Um, but yeah, he's got enough playables by the looks of things. So we're going to see that Ultra Ball get rid of a couple more Pokemon. He can play Stadium and um, the uh, Air Balloon, and he can go ahead and grab Luminion here with his second Ultra Ball. We're gaming. We just need to find ourselves a Grass Energy, and there's already um, the Training Court in hand and a discarded Grass. So it's a guaranteed two-prize KO. Guaranteed and Kywin has to be KO. kicking himself right this now. This is so good, because you're right. That Training Court lets you get a basic energy from the discard. There is one in the discard. Ooh. And right now, Kaiwin knows. He knows what's coming. He knows it's a Beedrill. Oh, and he knows that Mew has free retreat. He did not need to do this. Because you cannot boss his orders and mustard on the same turn. So Kaiwin here, it has to be... a. It's either a little bit of a lapse in judgment or it's just not thinking your opponent plays Beedrill. But this is, you know, it's the tiniest little mistake. And Arna is punishing here. This, I thought we were going to see Beedrill. <laughs> Didn't know we'd see it turn one. Yeah, it's normally you're expecting it off of Starbirth. But uh, Arna getting the job done with the double Ultra Ball hand. And we're going to see five more cards here. If you can get Arceus down We even down got as the well. Grass Energy. He's got Arceus for next turn to follow up as well with another V-Star and threaten even more Mustard plays potentially. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely crazy stuff. What a great start for Arna here. Oh, that is absolutely brilliant. And, you know, it's going to take something like, I mean, realistically, I suppose you've got your Mew and your double turbo energy. There's plenty of ways for Kaiwin to get a return KO here. But you're getting a return KO on a single prize Pokemon. And you've got to go after the Beedrill. Yeah. Because the Beedrill's just going to keep doing this if you don't get rid of it. Yeah, the, uh, the Beedrill is far too dangerous. And this gives Arna a really easy prize map now. Um, he can attach to his Beedrill, and then he's looking to just take like two other two prize KOs. It could be really easy for him, to be honest, especially with an Arceus coming down this turn and uh, also scouting out that Oranguru to protect a card on top of his deck by the looks of things. Yeah, absolutely. And this, I mean, this has just turned the entire game. Kaiwin had a phenomenal turn one, pretty much the best you could hope for, but left that Mew in the active, and Arna goes, well, you know, you can leave it in the active if you want, but, you know, have you met my Look Beedrill? This. Here we go, the Persist Sting, really stinging Kaiwin with a two-prize KO, picking up Raihan as well. Really not a bad card at all to take from prizes, because it means he can respond with an Arceus, even with a Beedrill going down next turn. And that can also grab him a V-Star, because his hand actually wasn't all that strong. I think he was relying on that Crobat that he put to the top of his deck with Oranguru without this, so it's another huge pickup for Arna, really cracking through this game brilliantly. No, oh, absolutely. And this one is going to be very interesting as we go through because, you know, I've, I've been in these games. I've had these games where I had those great turn ones and you think, yes, it is, I, it is on. I am winning. I am having a great turn. And your opponent does something you're not expecting. And you've got to recover from that because inside you're thinking, why did I leave that Mew active? How did my opponent have that hand? How did they, <laughs> you know, it's not just that you left the Mew active, but your opponent had to have a very good hand to pull that off. And it all went wrong. It was that perfect confluence of bad things that led to you going down by two prizes. And you've just got to kind of forget about it and carry on because actually it's so easy to just get yourself in that mindset of how did that go wrong? That shouldn't have happened. Yeah, you've got to shake it off, as you said. And we are going to see a power tablet get burned here just to draw an additional card from Genesect. After such a strong start, um, now he's a little bit clogged up with damage modifiers, which he might have to keep around for the Arceus V-Star later down the line. So just choosing to play one, keeping one remaining in hand, does rip the Quick Ball, though, which is going to help him thin out the VIP pass that he drew into. Uh, so we are going to see a second Meloetta come down now, Kaiwin knowing that essentially... Uh, now that there's one V Max already, or sorry, one V already down, he's going to try and maybe use even Melodious Echo via a Meloetta on this turn. 
Yeah, quite possibly that would be a nice response. It's always nice to get a KO of a single prize Pokemon, you know, force your opponent. But then again, you know, Arna's taking a two prize knockout, so if you do have to take out a Malouetta, that's just one Mew in its game. So, you know, even then, the prize map is not that difficult. It's it's awkward. I mean, Kaiwan's got that double turbo energy in hand, and you've got the Mew V Max, so the KO's on board here. But, you know, do we see Arna going after another Beedrill here? I mean, that's the problem, right? There's an Arceus that can V-Star and make another Mustard play. I believe uh, this would be the second Beedrill hitting the discard pile. It would. Uh, and I don't think there's any Pokemon recovery that I can see in the deck list. So, um, Kyron's not to know it, but there will no be, be no more Beedrills this game. Um, but he is going to commit that double turbo energy. I think he'd love to keep digging here to see if he could get himself in a lesser sparkle to put some energy exactly on his other two Pokemon here. So a big hit from uh, Kaiwin, who can start representing some single prize Pokemon attacking threats as well now. Um, but Kaiwin's by no means out of this game. It's, an, it's a little bit awkward that you're only taking a single prize knockout this turn and you're still like three attacks away from wi uh, winning the game. Uh, but Ana is basically forced to right hand next turn and uh, will just be hitting into a Mew, which won't feel great. No, absolutely. And the thing is, you know, getting those two Mew to strike energy on those two Meloetta, if you basically do that again, then you've got a Meloetta hitting for 280, which is enough to KO an Arceus V-Star, and you've potentially got, you know, a slightly weaker Meloetta coming along later as well, so there is a possibility of taking a couple of knockouts using those Meloetta, although we do see... Oh, it's got the... It's just got the air balloon attacked. It's just set to retreat. We're good. Yeah, we're all good with that air balloon <laughs> uh, Urshifu right now. Just using it as a pivot. The Raihan is going to be the first action for Ana. Going to help him get one de uh, card from his deck as well as an energy from his discard pile. That one card from deck can instantly turn into two cards from his deck <laughs> because he's most likely going to go ahead and grab his Arceus V-Star here. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. I mean, what more could you want? You want free energy on an Arceus V-Star, so use right hand to put one energy on, search out the Arceus V-Star, and then, of course, you've not used your energy attachment for the turn. You can use Arceus to search out double turbo. If you want to get that full attack with Arceus off, accelerating energy, doing 180 damage, you absolutely can here. What about something like a escape rope play here and you just even accept taking one prize and powering up something like the Flygon V that's found its way to its hand. I feel like that could be a really dangerous turn here because then you're still taking that one prize KO going down to three and then it's down to Kaiwin to like gust up that Flygon. I know it's something that's pretty possible but I don't know if there's many better plays here. Ana can't feel good about hitting into this um, UV Max I don't think. No because you're, you're two hit KOing and there's so much that can go wrong in the meantime. It's just I, I like taking the KOs, like you said. I think the escape rope could be a nice play. I like the idea of powering up that Flygon because that can get up to pretty nice damage. You know, it, it's generally played as fighting type attackers. Obviously, you're hitting weakness on things like Arceus, but it's just generally a good attacker. Oranguru once again putting that Crobat back to the top of the deck. Uh, looking for a different card, but hits just another Professor's Research, which isn't a big deal. Nice sequencing to do it pre-Star Birth, though, just in case you hit one of those cards you were going to go ahead and search for anyway, and it now means that Arna won't be drawing into that Crobat, which uh, he would prefer not to by the looks of things. So we're undoubtedly going to see that double turbo energy, and it looks like the Escape Rope is also going to be that next choice. This makes sense in terms of representing that prize race. Um, it's still going to be tricky for Arna to get round this Mu V Max, but certainly um, throwing off the Meloetta could be very helpful here. And of course, you're taking a fusion energy off the board, which um, is also going to keep that Meloetta out of range or force more power tablets, at least, from the likes of Kaiwen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, four fusion strike energy on a Meloetta hits 280. That's the perfect number to get mm -hmm. your Arceus. That's not good. Take one of them off, all of a sudden they're hitting 210. Well, that's 70 could've damage seen, away. We've missed a little Mew there. We could have got a quick Celebrations Mew dig in. He could have retreated free rope and got a little Celebrations look at th six cards. Oh, he could as well. That would have been a good one. Bit of a shame, but yeah. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. Uh, regardless, this is still a solid play, but uh, basically minus one to himself here. Um, but regardless, he's still uh, getting this prize map in his favor. And it's still awkward. Kyron has that big decision now. He's saying, Anna, did you actually go ahead and grab Choice Belt in preparation for this? Because this could be a huge scout play. Like If, if Kyron gambles here and says that Anna can't KO a 190 hit point Genesect, he'd be in great shape. But uh, looks like the safest route is still going to be throwing up this Meloetta. Otherwise, it's too easy to get KO'd. Or Anna's map could simply be gusting up another Genesect to close out the game here. And we are going to see the Rose Tower get bounced by the training court. Flygon V is coming down. Kaiwen's familiarizing himself with it. And uh, 
Arna is no doubt going to be powering up this Flygon. And that basically says to Kaiwin, hey, you have to knock out this Flygon, <laughs> otherwise you're going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't put up the Genesect if you're Kaiwin there, because if the Genesect goes down and you're right, a choice bout would do it, then all of a sudden you, you lose to a boss's orders. Yeah. And it's we've seen a million games where you lose to boss's orders, and generally boss's orders comes down. So you have to feed the Meloetta, which it really hurts the numbers in, in terms of, you know, this Arceus would be primed to be KO'd by Meloetta, and that's probably not happening now. So it's going to be quite awkward for Kaiwin to try and get that return KO on the Arceus. You know, Mew is a deck that's really good at hitting 210. 280 is doable, but it's so much more difficult. So Arna goes up here, three prizes to one, and it really is starting to look very, very nice. Because it's not just, and this is the thing about Arcus that makes it so good. It's not just the V-Star power, although that is amazing, but you're taking a KO and you're powering up. And we've seen this with Pikachu and Zekrom. We've seen it with Arcus and Algar and Palkia. If you can take KOs while powering up a Pokemon, it's very good. But Boss's orders comes down on that Flygon. It had to happen. Yeah, hoping a Mew doesn't have Boss is really not the <laughs> best strategy for you because it could so easily go wrong here. Kaiwen choosing not to put down any of his basic Pokemon in his hand pre his first uh, Genesect here. Can now thin with an Ultra Ball, which is a really nice pickup for him because he drew into another VIP pass. Uh, very helpful to get rid of those. The Mew VMAX already has a Choice Belt attached, uh, so it can easily just be copying Technoblast here for a KO. Flygon with that uh, low enough hit points for the KO. I believe it's 220 hit points. Um, so it's going to be in range as Kaiwen is now resetting to get that next Mew developed by the looks of things and uh, continuing to thin some of the more awkward cards from his hand with his Ultra Ball. Still has plenty of uh, Fusion Strike sips and systems to go, so I think he's going to be looking again uh, to try and accumulate some power tablets for the following turn because he still needs to work towards his Arceus uh, next turn. Absolutely. It is 220 on the Flygon. So, yeah, I mean, here it's just making sure you get that KO on the Flygon. There we go. Flygon goes down. And we're actually even on prizes now. And this isn't quite the game we were thinking it was a minute ago. You know, had Kaiwen not had the boss, and you're right, with a Genesect draw, he's probably yeah. going to have the boss. Yeah. But without the boss, that was basically game. Arna was in way too good a position. With it, you know, th this game could still go either way. You've got to lie that Arna's getting the next hit in. And at the end of the day, a two-hit KO on a Mew will still end the game. It's just... It's such a shame that Beedra was in the opening hand, because if it wasn't for that, I think this game probably would be over already. Yeah, and I think Arna would have loved to have had a boss's orders play this turn, because again, it feels so bad attacking into a Mew this turn. And I think as good as it's been to take these initial three prize cards, I think if Kaiwen can do like a psychic leap play, maybe KOing the Celebrations Mew that has such easy low hit points to deal with, it could be a great way for Kaiwen to leap back into the deck and have two Mews like represented to take his final two prize cards. So Kaiwen's clawed back into this game because Arna just hasn't had much of a follow-up after that crazy mustard turn one. No, there were so many times Arna almost had that perfect Pokemon, but because the Beedrill had to hit the discards, you had to have an empty hand for Mustard. That locked that out of the game. We had the Flygon with the energy on, but the boss took it down. So there's been a couple of opportunities for Arna here to have that really nice backup Pokemon, that second attacker. And every time, Kai would just got the answer. There's something which, or, you know, just goes wrong. We can't get it there. We do see an energy coming down on that Rapid Strike Urshifu. Yeah, I believe he discarded the VMAX earlier on in the game. He did. Was that, yeah, that was the target for him. He did. Uh, it was either that or he took a Mew out. He was debating the two of them. Uh, but it looks like he's actually going to bench another Mew here and simply retreat into his Arceus and uh, make the attack here, powering up that Urshifu as his only other attacking threat. I think ideally off that Marnie, he could have found a way to attack with like a Zapdos V and remove this double turbo. I think that would have been a pretty crafty play to get some damage in and maybe make it more difficult for Kaiwin to create a Psychic Leap play. As it happens, it didn't come off and now the Urshifu is going to get powered up on the bench uh, via the Trinity Nova and we're going to see a good amount of damage onto Kaiwin. It's going to be down to him to try and put a Mew into play and try and create a Psychic Leap. I think that's going to be the best route for him, especially knocking out a Mew, putting himself down to two prizes. But then you're still concerned that Arna could simply boss his orders and uh, take a two-prize KO on the only Mew in play. Yeah, that is a little bit awkward. We do see the power tablet coming down here. We've got an Ultra Ball, shockingly enough, for that Mew. And, of course, you go down to a zero-card hand, but Kaiwin doesn't care about having a zero-card hand. <laughs> Not when there's three Genesect on the board. And I think at this stage it's probably fair to say that Arna is probably not playing Path to the Peak. So 
it's just that when those Genesect are, you know, let to go just absolutely crazy, doing whatever they want, it means that the new player is within reason going to basically have what they want for the whole game. You're not going to see them whiffing those bosses' orders very often. You're going to see there them being able to get that Mew. Bosses' orders coming into that hand, so there is the Psychic Leap play option available for Kaiwen. He's already played a Power Tablet, so it is certainly possible. We are going to see a switch first from Kaiwen to see if he wants to make any other play here. It's actually going to be the boss's orders for the Urshifu, because it seems like he's concerned about a spreading attack here. So it may be a Meloetta KO and just hoping that Arna doesn't have boss's orders. And right now, that's the case. Yeah, that is a very interesting one because, like you say, Meloetta can absolutely take the KO. That's not a problem. It's hitting for 280 when you factor in the weakness with the two Fusion Strike energy on Kaiwen's side of the board. This is all well and good, but like you say, we've got a damage mute V Max on the board, and Arna's got that Genesis, that's that Arceus, sorry, already powered up. And it really is as simple as boss's orders, bring up the Mew, get the KO. So it's an awkward one. I, I understand exactly where Kyron's coming from here. You want to get rid of that I guess, Urshifu. Yeah, you can still Psychic Leap actually, because there was a power tablet played. So it's the same as just gusting up a Mew here. Um, but it gives Arna one more card, right? It allows the Celebrations Mew to actually look at the top six because it has an air balloon. Uh, so it could give Arna potentially like more outs to win next turn. So it's safer in that you're protecting yourself around a rapid flow potentially, but it allows Arna to have that better pivot this turn. Essentially, that's the only difference here. But I still think we'll see a Psychic Leap thanks to um, yeah. the there we choice go. belt plus power tablet taking us up to uh, 140, then the minus 20, oh, sorry, the 130. Then we go to uh, 110 with the reduction. But thanks to weakness, uh, we are going to see that two prize KO Kaiwen going down to one remaining. And uh, Arna has no way to win this turn uh, because there's still three prizes left. And Kaiwen's put himself in a position where Meloetta can easily take a one prize KO next yep. turn and Mew can easily take a one prize KO. So I think Kaiwen's got this wrapped. I mean, as long as you've got some kind of gusting to, you know, get around the Arceus or, I mean, to be honest with you, you know, that Inteleon's not really huge HP wise. So I'm just thinking if an escape rope comes down from Kaiwen here, that's that's like the biggest thing at the moment that's gonna come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think at this stage I think you're right. It's it's not I don't think guaranteed, but Kaiwen is in a very, very strong position here. Yeah, especially because he has so many like chromatics left. He's not really played many <laughs> of them. And although it's a coin flip card, it can get you like an ideal piece. And we've just seen like the double turbo energy go back into the deck and whatnot. So um, we do see the poker gear before the Mew now. We are seeing the mysterious tail. It's going to grab himself a quick ball. Could Arna make any interesting line here? Uh, to make it more awkward for Kaiwen. It feels like, yes, going for a boss's orders play to at least take all the energy out of uh, the deck would be reasonable or out of play, but we know there's a double turbo still remaining. That's why I feel like that Zapdos on the previous turn would have been such a big swing for him. Yeah, I mean, like, I, th I think taking the Meloetta down is right. I think you're absolutely correct about that. But you're still talking, and this here is exactly go. what we're seeing from Arna here, taking out that Meloetta. But it still just means Mu V Max, double turbo energy, Boss's orders and there's the already win. a double turbo in hand for Kaiwen, so it's not going to be much here. It's just digging for that final boss's orders. I don't think it even needs to be boss's orders, you know. I think an escape, escape rope would rope. do True. it because True. even with double turbo, you're hitting 190. That's enough to get and the And there's minion. already rope in hand as well. Uh, Kaiwen is uh, just going through the actions here before drawing for turn, but I think he is breathing a sigh of relief. He's got away with one here. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's a free card combo we're looking for. I think Escape Rope is in hand. I think he's already there. Yeah, yeah it absolutely is. So we're looking for Double Turbo, Mu V Max. If those two cards come out, we do see a heads on Grammatic. That is absolutely huge. I think he grabbed the V Max there. Yeah, absolutely did. And there's a Double Turbo, and there is the Escape. Oh, boss's orders. Oh, boss's orders. That doesn't matter. They're nicely. all there. <laughs> he had it in so many different combinations. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Brings up the Mew, takes the KO, and Kaiwen does take a 1-0 lead in this important Swiss Round 12 match. It's That was very, very scary. Giving up that Beedrill KO turn one was huge, <laughs> and it's always got to be in the back of your mind. I did not have to give up that KO. You called it yourself before yeah. the turn went over. You need to retreat the Mew just in case. But then again, we knew Beedrill was there. Yeah. It's one of those things where Kaiwen's been spared his blushes by after that small head slap moment, he has played perfectly for every other turn of the game. Oh, yes. And it's clawed him back. I think Arna missed a couple of things in that mid-game. Having to attach to that Urshifu isn't ideal by any means. If he was able to get that Zapdos, maybe removing a double turbo energy could have been an extra bit of headache for Kaiwen uh, in that sort of middle 
period of the game, but I think it's really down to the fact that there's only two Beedrill in Arna's list and he had to discard one in those openings. He wasn't able to go ahead and grab like a Ranguru to protect it in those opening stages. That could have been a great way uh, to try and allow yourself a double Beedrill because it feels like one may not be enough for this matchup. No, absolutely not. We saw how important it was and we also saw that, you know, Kaiwan was just playing special energy. Like, yeah. all gamers, just special energy. You got the feeling, you know, we saw Kaiwan setting up those two Meloetta in the early game, almost basically saying, look, I might have to try and fight this Meloetta for a while. I might have to basically use my two Meloetta to get rid of a couple of Beedrill. And if we, I could navigate that, then I can go into Mew and really go through the rest of the game. Well, as it happened, there was no second Beedrill. That Flygon could have been huge, but Flygon got grabbed off the bench. There's a world where that Urshifu could have been big, but that got dragged up and KO'd. And one of the things we really saw in that game was the speed and consistency of that Mew deck. Every time Kaiwan needed a gusting effect, the boss's orders, it was there. When they needed the energy, it was there. They didn't really whiff anything. But part of that was knowing the matchup. Part of it was that phenomenal setup with those three Genesect early doors. And then we saw little things like that Psychic Leap with Mew, mm -hmm. getting the KO to take that gusting win off the board. And that really does make the difference. But we are into game two, and it does look like Arna is going first here. And it looks like we've got a couple of Mew, we've got an Air Balloon, we've got an Arceus. Not a bad start. This is an absolutely phenomenal start, to be honest. <laughs> the Mysterious Tail helping you get an Air Balloon, not a bad thing at all as well, especially because you know that Mew isn't going to hand disrupt you at all. So you can either hold this in your hand, or if you already have access to even more switching outs, you can get an extra Mysterious Tail in. We already see double Turbo Energy in his hand as well, so he's got the ideal turn one Arceus start. These um, Mew have helped him get there. I believe there's already a Beedrill in hand, so yeah, it's just going to pass rather than put down the Air Balloon, just in case Kyron doesn't take a KO in the active position. But Arna's got a fantastic board state. He's done something that you really have to do against Mew as the player going first, get two one prize Pokemon into play, one of them being active. This means that even if there is an Alessa Sparkle combo turn, um, they can only take a one prize KO because even with an escape rope, you just throw the other Mew at Kaiwin. So this is a great way to try and skew that prize race and make it that little bit more awkward. Kaiwin, though, kicking off with another VIP pass, it, it's got to feel good. Yeah, you love to see it, you know, getting those two basic Pokemon and. And, it, it, you know, the, the thing about this Mew deck is it's not just searching out a basic Pokemon. It's searching out a Genesect, which is going to draw you a bunch of cards, which is then going to get you further along. Now, we did see a Genesect start, so we see a Genesect and a Mew being searched out by Kaiwen here. That seems like the right way to go. You want those Genesect as fast as possible to draw cards, but there's a limit. You still need to get your Mew so you can start getting potentially some energy on or at least just have it down so you can evolve it the following term. As for the energy, it really depends. You know, can you pull off that Meloetta play? You need an attachment for the turn and an Elisa Sparkle. It's doable. We see it a lot, but it can be a lot to ask. Kyron may not even find it that valuable, to be honest, because if you start spreading special energies like all around your attackers, it can just allow the Beedrill to be even more dangerous. <laughs> so Kyron may just accept that like this one prize knockout isn't doing like enough for him to be worth threatening his own Muse or whatever. So we could see a completely different approach where you don't go for the tr traditional turn one. You instead go a little bit more conservative, but his hand is still pretty much gas. I mean, we're going to see an Ultra Ball here going down to one card remaining in hand, which I believe is a Switch, which is also a burner here. Um, so we're going to see a lot of Fusion Strike 6 uh, systems at the very least. Yeah, having those three Genesect out at the moment, you're drawing until we've got four cards in hand, which is fine. You know, I mean, the alternative we've got for non-Fusion Strike decks is Cricketune, and that only draws <laughs> to four in hand. If you're active, it's only three on the bench. So this is a nice start. And of course, Ooh, you know, another VIP. <laughs> I was going to say, if you can use that first Fusion Strike system to get more basics, then the next couple are going to start looking a lot tastier. Yeah, that is fantastic stuff. Uh, we can see the debate now whether or not he wants to go for double Meloetta, uh, because once you've put these Pokemon into play, it's down to Arna to really knock out Pokemon to sort of open up your board again. But I do like this approach from Kaiwin. Get some one prize attackers down. These are going to try and make it awkward, like he did in game one, to sort of catch up here. As uh, we look at a few of those prize cards, the Oranguru in the prizes is a little bit awkward potentially again for Arna because I believe he has a Beedrill in his hand, so he may be limited to one this game once again. We're going to see the energy drop onto Meloetta safely on the bench as uh, we can see a ton of Ultra Balls make their way into Kaiwen's hand here off the second Genesect. One remaining, but he may just sit on this hand to be honest because uh, you may want to save some of these resources for the following turn. No, absolutely. That's, that's a very sensible. I mean, here... 
I, I think you're right. I think, you know, we, we're not going to see an attack from Kyle. We just do see the retreat there into Meloetta. And I think you called it. It's There's not enough value taking a KO here. And what you don't want to do, you know, if Beedrill comes down this turn, and Beedrill absolutely could, hey, if you've got some gusting, you can take out Meloetta. Well, that's not a good situation. It's not like Yang a two prize KO on a Mew turn one like we saw last game. So Arna here, probably not going to go for the Beedrill. But then you've got that awkward thing whereby... Arceus gets Beedrill. Yeah. And Beedrill is way more consistent if you're using Arceus's V-Star power. But here, if you use a V-Star power and you've kind of got to evolve, if nothing else, then you can get the Beedrill, but it's probably going to be gusted and KO'd. Yeah, it's one of those things where Mew already coming through, by the way, getting an Ultra Ball, which really smooths out Ana's hand. So I think it, the, uh, the Mustard is on if he wants it. So Ana could do this thing where you get your V-Star, get a one prize knockout, and develop Beedrill on the bench, which is scary for Kaiwin to deal with. Uh, or you can go hunting for boss's orders, just try and boss the only Mew in play, um, and try and take a two prize KO. Uh, alongside um, getting uh, Flygon down, something like that, to have a backup attacker for the following turn. Yeah, there are certainly some powerful lines of play, and you're right. And I, I think that's what we didn't see from Arna in the first game. We never got that board state where, well, I've got two or three different attackers, so I've got options. There was always ever really one attacker, and all the, all the backup plans were foiled every single time. And I think that's what Arna needs to try and get done this game. Try and make sure that when my opponent takes out that Pokemon, I've got something else ready to go. So the fact that Arna chose not to take boss's orders from that seven tells us that he's going down the mustard route, I think. Yeah. Uh, discarding that second uh, supporter in his hand that he also doesn't want to use. Uh, I think he'd be looking for his Orangru here, but he's going to find out that it's prized. I think he would have liked to have protected a Beedrill, but uh, not an option right now, um, which may make his curve a little bit more awkward here. Um, but he could still develop uh, another V Pokemon, possibly something like the Flygon for a later turn, even the Urshifu being threatened because being able to double KO Meloetas is actually super scary if you are ending up attacking with an Arceus this turn. So are still some options, even though it's a slightly more awkward turn overall, but at the very least he could potentially fin here with Quick Ball, get rid of one of these excess Mews to improve his draws after the Mustard. No, absolutely. That would be a sensible thing to do. And I like the idea of having that Beedrill down. Yeah, sure, it's a little bit scary if it gets gusted and KO'd because, you know, it really is your... Well, was a secret weapon. Yeah. Very good secret game one, less so here. <laughs> but just the option of having it down is huge. We do see a Flygon coming down here. Yeah. And I like this one as well. I like the idea of using Arceus this turn or next turn and really starting to build up that Flygon. But we do see the Ultra Ball coming down here. And if we see Luminion, then that is the That's giveaway. It's a sure, V-Star. Right? Yeah, it's oh. going to be Star Birth. We've got the Air Balloon already from last turn. We can Star Birth. Uh, towards Mustard and a turn attachment, so you can guarantee that you're attacking with Arceus this turn uh, for a KO, uh, and it means that you can be powering up that Flygon very easily, uh, and uh, we're going to see the attachment and the Mustard straight away. Five fresh cards, uh, including a lovely Stage 2 hitting the board uh, <laughs> from the deck, and uh, yeah, his turn is pretty much well mapped out here. He's only taking a one prize KO, which is a little bit awkward, but again, you're putting Kaiwen in, in this situation, that, that headache of Man, that Beedrill is so scary. How am I going to get around this? I'm having to accumulate a boss's orders just to KO a one prize Pokemon. It doesn't seem like, seem like great value, especially because Flygon is going to be that second threat, that thing that we talked yeah. about. Flygon threatening a KO, and so is Beedrill. And you've still got your free energy Arceus doing decent damage as well. You know, yep. Arceus can't take down a Mew V Max, but it can take down a Genesect and it can take down a Meloetta. So this is what I really wanted to see from Arna this game. I adore this. It's multiple threats. It's multiple attackers. It's, you know what? Take up a Beedrill, I'll get you a Flygon. Take up a Flygon, <laughs> I'll get you a Beedrill. Take them out, take both of them out. Well, I've probably taken a KO and I've still got my Arceus. <laughs> and every time I attack with Arceus, I can be building something else up on the bench. So so this is really nice. It's the one thing Arnold was not able to do in game one, and I really do think it's going to make a big difference here. Yeah, his threats came one at a time in the previous game, yes. and that was the big difference that Kyron was able to piece apart and basically ignore the Arceus the entire game and saying, I'm not afraid of 180 damage. Why would I be? Let's just uh, deal with the things that can take the one-hit KOs. So Kyron... Yeah, you can see he's debating right now. He's thinking, man, if I take this two prize knockout on the Flygon, it is obviously helpful to me <laughs> because that's better in the prize race. So you can try and formulate a 2 2 2 prize map just to win in three attacks. Uh, because Arna is always going to get a response on this Mew, basically. The other alternative is try and do like a psychic leap knockout potentially. If you can do that on the B drill, it could be decent. 
but straight away it's going to be a boss's orders. Tablets being thrown down, and we're going to see some Genesec drawing by the looks of things. Yeah, absolutely. But and I, I like this. I like this play. I like getting rid of the Flygon. But it means that if Arna's got a Grass Energy, that return KO is coming. And with a single prize Pokemon. And what probably happens here, you, you know, you end up trading, you take out the Flygon, so Beedrill takes out the attacker. But then you've got Genesis, uh, excuse me, you've got Arceus as well. If a Meloetta is ever active, then that can be taken out by the Arceus. And we're going to end up seemingly with a real back and forth just trading KOs here. And it really depends on who's able to get the KOs with what. And really, it's that Beedrill. If that Beedrill can ever get into a position to take out a Mu V Max, that could be, a, well, that would be a huge difference. Yeah, it would mean that Ana could easily win in two attacks because, again, the Beedrill would be so dangerous, it would have to be dealt with almost. And then the Arceus could be doing a boss's orders play on a Genesect as long as you get a damage modifier uh, in the form of the Choice Belt or the Zigzagoon uh, coming in. So, uh, yeah, the map is pretty easy for Arna here. It's down for Kaiwin to try and navigate it to the best of his ability. We've already seen the Ultra Ball getting that second uh, Mew V on the board. We can see a Rotom Foam now putting his chosen card to the top. It's going to be a Fusion Energy. Uh, so we have seen two power tablets, and Kaiwin's oh, not Kai able to fight. Yeah, so I think what he was saying to himself there was, I have to take a knockout with a Meloetta and get an additional damage modifier that turn, so the Beedrill wasn't able to take a three-prize KO. Yes. I think he saw it was too easy, or going to be too easy, for Ana to just win in two attacks. So just trying to go down a more awkward route with a second Meloetta coming in was uh, Kaiwin's best chance to win the game, but the cards just didn't fall in the right place there. An Ultra Ball getting rid of two other Ultra Balls was a really bad feeling <laughs> because they are such good hand thinning cards. Even though he still had more Genesex remaining, he had no more cards that he could thin out of his hand. Uh, and that was ultimately his downfall in the second game. And wow, another great, impressive show from Arna's deck. Even though he didn't win that first game, it was so great to see uh, the Beedrill in action. And once again, just being on the board, not even attacking this game, was one of the key pieces to his success. Absolutely. And that was really, really big, like you say. Wanted the KO with the Meloetta. Because you could have got the KO pretty easily with a Mu V Max, but then you get KO'd by Beedrill yeah, and the game is over. Yeah. The thing with Meloetta is you need to try and do it without attaching too much energy to your other Pokemon, which powers up Beedrill. So you have to try and do it with damage modifiers, at which point you need, I think it was three damage modifiers were needed yeah. with the two Fusion Strike energy, and that was just too much to ask for. And I like the concession there, because we're at this stage where top eight is so tight, you need such a good record. Ties at this stage of the game, you know, we got word that Tor tied in the previous round, but Tor went into the game with one tie and no losses, so could absolutely afford a tie. Tord is on for top eight at this stage. Not everyone's in that position. If you're not going to win game two, but you did win game one, scoop up your cards, concede the game, go to game three. And you've only got about 15 minutes. This game is not going to last very long, no matter how it plays out. But you've got time to try and get that quick victory here because a lot of the time when you're this deep into the tournament, if you're not on table you know, really one, two, or three, then a tie is probably not helping you. Yeah, and Kaiwin is sharp as attack. He knows exactly where the game was going. He could see the next two turns that he had to go for, as well as what Ana had set up. Uh, so why waste time allowing the opponent to go through the motions? Uh, it was basically guaranteed, and Kaiwin is a fantastic player. We're getting into this third game with, I think, just over 10 minutes on the clock, something like that. Yeah, 12 minutes or so. So Kaiwin's really got to go as quickly as possible here. He once again has a VIP pass, man. This never happens for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great feeling, though. You've got a couple Genesex already developed. Uh, I think, as we saw in game one, uh, you can stumble with moments at Mew and punish Ana here and there because his attackers sometimes can be that little bit reactive or have a naturally low base output. And uh, we're seeing more ball search in the hands. So Kaiwin is going to have a barnstorming turn once again, I think, by the looks of things here. Absolutely, but time is absolutely of the essence. You've got to take those six prizes. We've talked about this before. In a best of three series, the only games that count are completed games, which means one player has achieved a win condition. Either they've knocked out six prizes worth of Pokemon, or they've knocked out all of their opponent's Pokemon, or their opponent is unable to draw a card to begin their turn. You've got to reach. It's not like Top Cut where you have to have a winner. So with one game each having won, it's like we saw with the, the Malamar against Malamar VMAX earlier on. If both players win one game, this game three is super important. If it doesn't finish, 
then this game doesn't count. It's 1-1, it's a tie. And both these players probably get slightly further away from getting into that top eight. So it really is, it, it's counterintuitive to a lot of the way players think, but you kind of need to sometimes play f a bit faster, check your deck a little bit less rigorously, think through a little bit less than you would. Nobody wants to play that way, but if the alternative is a tie which doesn't really help you, sometimes it's worth just playing a bit faster and hoping it works out. Absolutely, and Cohen showing the power of the quad rotom phone. It was the engine that we saw to so much success in the um, Australian regionals, and uh, it's grabbed him VIP pass, I think, in all three of the games so far, <laughs> off of a one-card draw. So what a crazy, crazy card these rotom phones have been, and Cohen's continuing to use them on these openings. Now he can get himself an attachment for the turn, basically one of the last things he needs because his board is once again full of Fusion Strike Pokémon. No, absolutely. We've seen it three games in a row. Game one, game two, game three. Kaiwan has ended up, and it's it's been a very similar thing. It's been three Genesect. It's been a you know three Genesect, one Mew, one Meloetta, and then either a second Mew or Meloetta, depending on what it is Kaiwan's actually going for in the particular game. But they've had their ideal setup in three games here, so no excuses in terms of draw. This Mew deck is doing what it's supposed to do, and it looks like. Yeah, pretty well set for the next turn. Yeah. A bit calling on to VMAX as well. Uh, so plenty of options. Let's see what Arna can come up with. Uh, there's no crazy B drill play by the looks of his opening hand, at least not for getting a KO this turn. Uh, so it might be a slower approach from Arna here, which is a bit of a shame for him. Uh, but we will at least be seeing a quick ball to start things off. I think ideally in these sorts of si situations where you don't have aggressive pressure with the Arceus, it's great to at least try and get a Trinity charge off, try and get something like another energy onto an Arceus and like one onto a Beedrill or something like that. Uh, but it looks like we are eyeing up the uh, Aranguru, so potentially it's going to be one of these situations where you get the Beedrill and just have it as a reactive threat on the board. It yeah. could still be on the table for him. Yeah, and I, but I love that. That works so well in the last game. But, you know, we, we saw last game. It's really important, the difference, you know, between game one and game two. If you bring out your threats one by one, then you let Kaiwen do his thing. If you bring them all out at once, you basically Ooh. checkmate your opponent. I think that's a second mustard coming into the hand. So I think he was looking to get bailed out by... Um, actually, no, there's an Ultra Ball in hand. So we are going to see the mustard here. Here we go, getting rid of Crobat and Mustard to use another one as uh, he can simply Ultra Ball out a Mew here as a one prize option, uh, just to put it onto the board as a yep. pivot. And uh, we are going to see Mustard turn one <laughs> once again. He's done it without Starbirth both times. Thanks to these great discarding ball search cards, he's found a way once again. And Beetle is a huge headache. Like, once again, Kaiwen's in that situation where he could come in with a Mew VMAX and take a big KO, but Beedrill's threatening once again. And uh, if you come in with Meloetta, you're losing a ton of Fusion Strike energy in the process. So. The Beedrill is a huge headache, no matter how you slice it. Absolutely. And is that turn one, three games in a row, we've seen the Beedrill. That is absolutely phenomenal. And it's just there as a little bit of a check. You don't need to attach energy to it. It's a single energy Pokemon. You can attach energy when you want to attack with it. But it basically says to Kaiwen, look, you're only playing special energy. So now, if you dare to attach an energy to your Pokemon, <laughs> I can go out with Beedrill for a single energy. And it's so... Once that Beedrill's on the board, the amount of resources you're putting into it are so many minimal, but it completely changes the way that Kaiwen has to approach the game. We saw game one, we had this big splurge, loads of energy, and Beedrill came out, and ever since then, games two and game three, Kaiwen has been extremely cagey with energy attachments. You can't just randomly Elise a Sparkle onto a Mew and a Genesect, because then they're targets. No, everything's been uh, very calculated from Kaiwen throughout the entire game, and I love how you put it, if you dare do this, the Beedrill's <laughs> coming in. That's exactly how it feels, because it literally does sting you if you're, uh, if you're playing into it. Uh, Arna now has the option, maybe could be searching out that space for Flygon, but no, he's actually filling up his board with quite a number of one prize Pokemon here. It's a small concern for me because I'd like to see him represent multiple threats on his board, like we've seen um, to success um, in that second game. So um, yeah, he's filled up his board with more Mews here. Maybe he's got a game plan to leave one of these Mews in the active to end his turn. That could be one of the reasons why he's looking for this. Quite possibly. I'll be honest with you, it makes me sad to not see the Flygon. We've seen in both games so far, Flygon hasn't actually done anything. But in both of the games where Flygon's hit the board, we've accelerated energy to it and Kaiwen's gone, nah, I ain't doing that. Now we uh, we've seen a failed energy search for no target here. A uh, bit curious for me, uh, but he is going to go for a training court instead and get the energy out of the discard pile for his turn attachment here. Um, I think we're just uh, figuring out that there was no search from the... 
Oh, sorry, no shuffle from the energy search yeah. before the uh, the draw off the Rose Tower, but I think we should be good here because uh, the deck was already random. It wasn't uh, not going to be a big issue, but he can guarantee that turn attachment with the training court. I feel like I would have liked to have kept the energy in the discard pile anyway, uh, and you could have just held the training court for yourself. Um, but regardless, uh, the stadium is going to come down. We are going to see the energy attached to the active. It seems unintuitive, but it's basically saying then, come on then, Kaiwin, come and hit me with a, with a Mew, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> but like the, the downside is if it comes via a Meloetta, that's going to be uh, far more dangerous. It is going to be a lot more dangerous, but Meloetta's very, again, getting that KO is not easy. Meloetta, you know, you're going to, you can either release a sparkle, but then you've got to put energy on a Pokemon to make it vulnerable to B drill. Yeah. Or you just attack for turn. You're only doing 140. So then you've got to try and add 80 damage, which means free damage modifiers, you know, choice belt and power tablet. That's not an ideal situation. It's absolutely possible. And I think we've seen one power tablet one play. Tablet played, yep. But it's it's asking a lot, and we saw it didn't work in the previous game. Kaiwen tried exactly this and it did not play out. So if it doesn't work out. Do you attack with a Mew and give it up to the B drill? Do Ooh. you hit and not get a KO? I mean, n neither of those are good ideas. Well, we see the Sparkle. Uh, so now it looks like we're going for the Sparkle play, probably onto the Meloetta and just the Mew V rather than the V Max. So it's yeah. not an easy uh, boss's orders target for the B drill. Uh, and then he's just looking for a pivot option. The only awkward thing right now is that he plays two Switch and two copies of Escape Rope. So if you spend all these resources, actually he's going to go for a Genesis as well. So even valuing the Fusion Energy higher still, not even putting it onto a Mew V, putting it onto a Genesect V instead, um, because that's something that Ana is much less likely to target, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's so not a threat. It's, it's a great yeah. draw engine, but it's not a threat. Now, is the fourth Genesect in deck, or has it been discarded? I'm not sure, to be honest. If it's still in deck, that's even less worrying, because if Genesect yeah. goes down, you just replace it. You haven't even lost any draw power at that stage. So we've seen one tablet down. Uh, we will see an Ultra Ball here getting rid of an Echoing Horn by the looks of things and another Mew V Max. And uh, that's going to get no target here. Kaiman doesn't want to commit to two V Maxes on the board if he doesn't have to. And uh, is going to be content to just draw as much as possible here from his second Genesect of the turn. Absolutely. Lots of cards being drawn, lots of things going on. I mean, the KO Kramomatic. is... <laughs> Kramomatic could be his option to retreat here. I think <laughs> he's also hit double turbo energy, which is guaranteed attach retreat if he has to on his Genesect V. Uh, but we're going to see the Kramomatic getting rid of a VIP first. Yeah. And it does hit head, so this is going to be a cleaner route here where he can grab a switch. It means he can attach double turbo for the turn onto Mew V or onto the Genesect V even. <laughs> it is actually possible. Yeah. They're not bad options. I think it's fair to say it's not going to go on to the Mew V Max. No. But other than that, I think we are pretty good. So here does come the Meloetta. It's hitting 210, but we did see that power tablet come down. So it's hitting 240. That is more than enough. And what we see here is Kaiwen having to navigate the matchup. And, and I mean, the play from Kaiwen here does need to be pointed out. This is really, really good play. He's thinking about it. He's thinking about attaching to the Genesect. <laughs> I love this. Sometimes you can actually use Technoblast this way around, where it's only with a two prize Pokemon rather than a three prize. <laughs> I think it's spicy. It, it makes sense in my head, at least. Definitely debating it, but no, choosing not to. And uh, just taking the two-prize KO. He feel, I feel like he's pretty far ahead here. Arna hasn't been able to put pressure on very early on. That's Arceus going down, so there won't be a V-Star power for at least a couple turns here. Uh, so he's really just down to his little Mew draw engine, which is uh, not all that powerful. He's really going to need some help from this Mew by the looks of things. He's got not a lot going on. Yeah, I mean, he, he can KO with a Galarian Zapdos because there's a million Pokemon V on Kaiwood's side of the board. It's a single fighting energy to do 170 damage and discard a special energy so that'll get a KO on the Meloetta but how close are you really like it's I mean I think it's at this stage about the only way you're getting a KO save the Beedrill but you're not going to use a Beedrill Ultra Ball from the Mew gives him the heroic mustard I actually think there's the second Beedrill yep in deck this time so both Beedrills are live uh, you can easily see a Beedrill coming in for a response KO here we're going to need to find a switching out and an energy attachment from these five cards there's a lot to ask for but potentially he could go lower once again he's got a Ranguru to help him out he's got Rose Tower that could potentially help him out as well uh, on Kaiwin's side which both players can take advantage of so a big five cards coming in for Arna here he's going to need a response KO if he's going to win a race here no absolutely and we've you know I like that we've now got some attackers kind of rolling here we've got the two Beedra we've got the Galarian Zapdos but we are really running out of time 
And yeah. with so many single prize Pokemon running around, I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get enough KOs happening here. I mean, in theory, Kaiwin can win in three attacks. But the problem is, you know, if turn's called an Ana's turn, then you're only going to actually get to... Well, if time is called before the end of Kaiwin's turn, then they're only actually going to get two more attacks. And unless Ana benches a Pokemon V, that is actually going to lock Kaiwin out of winning the game. We've got a minute left until time is going to be called. Unless another two prize Pokemon hits the board and there's a full bench. <laughs> I mean, realistically, Kaiwin's probably not going to finish his turn before time is called, which means they're going to have to attack three times in order to win. But they're going to be turn zero and turn two. They're not going to have three more attacks. Not that Arna's in a, in a particularly better position. They've potentially got this one and then two more if they're really quick. But they would have to take a Pokemon VKO now before time was called. And then on turn one and turn three, they would have to take VKOs as well. Mm -hmm. I think Arna's the only one that actually can win this game. But we need to see a Pokemon VKO taken before time is called and then two more on the, those last two turns. It really is coming down to the wire here. Well, there's just a fighting energy in hand, I think. Arna doesn't want to commit it to the Zapdos. He's got two card draws for any switch out here. And he also has a Rangru as his final option. Still one card to see, and it's not going to be a switching out. So no pivot for this Mew, which means no attack being launched this turn by Arna. And I think they're just talking over turns there. I saw the hand actions when you start yeah. showing your opponent one way, then the other. <laughs> I think that's often a telltale sign. But just an energy drop onto that Galarian Zapdos V with no damage coming in. It's just a pass. I it's mean, one of those moments where you think if Kyron had all the time in the world, he's in complete control here. As it happens, we're on turns, and I think Arna was just using the die there as well to show that uh, Kyron is going to look like he's turn one. Yeah, so time was called an Arna's turn, as we expected. And nobody's going to win this game. Kaiwin's got two turns to take four prizes. There's not, that, that's not possible. With Kaiwin's deck and Arna's board, you're not taking four prizes in two turns. Arna's got, was it one turn now to take yeah. six, oh, sorry, six <laughs> prizes? That is definitely not, not happening. Yeah. So I think it, Arna's just going to check to make sure the Echoing Horn's in the discard pile. I think that's the only thing that could have been the pitfall for him. Yeah, Echoing yeah. Horn's there. So Arna knows this is going to end in a tie. I think uh, it's pretty certain now that there's not going to be too much going on. I think Arna can simply just announce pass for the next two turns. It won't change anything. Absolutely. But even if the Mew had been KO'd, Arna could have played that Ultra Ball to get a single prize Pokemon. True. And fill up the bench, and then Echoing True. Horn would have been blocked anyway. So... Unfortunately, you know, we, we've seen a good game, and I think I was putting himself in a good position here. And I, I kind of want to see this game finish out, honestly, because yeah. between the two Beedrill and the Galarian Zapdos, and that, that lack of pivot last turn for Mana was absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. I don't think this game was decided. I think it's still within the realms of possibility. Either player could have won this game, and it's, it's a little bit sad we're not going to see it play out properly. We do still have a couple more turns. The players are going to play it out, see how it goes, but... You know, we've already seen the die. We know Kaiwen is turn one. And there just aren't four prizes in two turns worth of games. It's, it's sad, but this is the way it goes. And although this does, you know, really reduce the risk, uh, the risk, the chance of them making top eight, we've talked a lot before, top 16 points, top 32 points. These can be really big deals for, you, for both of these players. Yeah, and Kaiwin just playing the game out, making sure, you know, Arna could make a mistake at this point. He could end up putting down a two-prize Pokemon. You never know. Uh, so he's doing all he can and uh, takes a two-prize KO this turn. Arna simply just going to promote a uh, Beedrill here and uh, is eyeing up. Looks like a Raihan play. Yep, he's going to Raihan to his Beedrill, get that grass energy out of the discard pile. He can search his deck for any card here. I imagine it's not going to be a two-prize Pokemon that he puts into play. <laughs> I'd at least hope not. <laughs> but I think uh, he's feeling pretty safe about uh, his choice and uh, his position in the game at this point. Absolutely. I am wondering if there is a single-prize Pokemon available. I didn't see much. He was, oh, there is. There's one Mew left. Exactly so, yeah. gone for. There we As go. So says. now even the Echoing Horn play would not have been an option here. Yep. So there we see the tie. And it's unfortunate when you see two good players with two good decks ending up in a tie. But... The reality is that's what we have. Two good players, two good decks, very good play from both of them. And we really saw, I mean, we did see some very good play, game two especially. You know, we saw Kaiwen really making sure that they were not putting themselves in a position where they were at risk of that Beedrill unnecessarily. But then we saw Arna set up all of those threats. 
and just basically going, look, you, you can't take them all. <laughs> yeah, it's razor thin margins. And this matchup really is a dicey one. You have to tread carefully as Mew. And it's not like normal archetypes where you can see the Moltres coming, for example. You can play around Path of the Peak proactively with that Rotom phone and putting Stadium to the top. But the Beetle can just kind of spring out of nowhere. <laughs> and you're like, oh, OK, this is happening. And you did it somehow on turn one without the Star Birth. Cool. <laughs> like, uh, it didn't really play around this. But yeah, to claw back into that game after such a big disadvantage, like essentially throwing away two prize cards and clawing back that game one uh, straight away was really impressive stuff. So Kaiman, no doubt, uh, has the Mew chops. He knows what he's doing with that deck. Oh, yeah. I talk about calm under pressure. You know, you're in day two. It's an international championships. You're on stream. The stress levels are high. You know, you make that mistake right at the beginning of the game. You basically give your opponent a free two prizes. Yeah. And then you just recover and win the game anyway. Yeah. That is a level of calm and composure, which, which you need at a big tournament like this. But I, I was really impressed by that. And, you know, in game one, Anna losing that Beedrill early on, having to discard it to use a Mustard was obviously a big deal. That Flygon being taken out as soon as it hit the board both <laughs> games was obviously a big deal. Yeah. But we just saw both players who knew what they were doing. And... And that was a really interesting game of Pokemon because both players had their game plans and you could see them. They were almost like proactively reacting. They were yeah. looking, what is my opponent going to do? How do I stop that? It's benching that Beedra when you don't really need it. It's choosing not to release a Sparkle when you've got the option. Just making sure that you're not doing anything for which you're going to end up being punished. Yeah, it's it's one of those like I have the answer, you have the answer kind of thing, and uh, you keep people honest. That sort of thing. You deny uh, Mew from its optimal game plan. You force more draws out of Kaiwin by trying to dig for those tablet players attacking with Meloetta, which is why Kaiwin ended up scooping up that second game. He couldn't get that crazy combination because the Beedrill was just sat there on the bench checking him the entire time and saying, "You can't do your main attacker. You can't use it. It's uh, irrelevant at this point because you're simply." lose a prize race by the other things that I've set traps for <laughs> on the bench. So, uh, yeah, a really interesting archetype. And uh, it's been cool to see uh, Arceus Beedrill. It's also doing well with Inteleon as a pairing um, by Reiji as well, who's at the top tables. So really awesome to see that Arceus Beedrill being a powerful combination this weekend. No, absolutely. We're seeing some very good players. Sylveon won a, won a round three game. Um, so they are absolutely, you know, just carrying on and we're, we're seeing a real mix here and I, th I think we're going to see some Mew in top eight but Sylveon looks like a very good shout for top eight toward with that Urshifu uh, with the Inteleon yeah. which I think at this stage you know is getting to the point where they almost can't miss top eight. Tord is pretty much on at this stage. You know, you mentioned Reiji, the, the Japanese player who's come over with that Inteleon build with Beedrill, who seems to be doing very, very nice indeed. So I think we are getting to that stage now where we're starting to, we're not putting people in top eight, but we're starting to really see some of those favorites. And it is a mix of deaths. But, you know, just to go back to Beedrill for a second, I really like cars like Beedrill. Because even when they don't do what they're supposed to do, they're still impacting the game. They're saying to your opponent, <laughs> one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to put your special energy down and I'm going to punish you, or you're not going to put your special energy down so that I don't punish you. But that's still an advantage for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm forcing you to play the game in a suboptimal way to try and avoid my plays. And whenever you can make your opponent do that, that's a huge advantage. Yeah, and uh, just seeing the mustard in action is always great fun. I mean, we've loved seeing Archie's ace in the hole. It ended up winning uh, the World Championships one year with yeah. uh, Archie Blastoise. Yeah, and, Jacob uh, Van Wagner won. Yeah, also uh, Maxis with the Gallade, often a <laughs> popular combination as well. Now we're seeing it in the modern age, even with the support of rule change. It's still valuable enough to get things like Beedrill out into play of all Pokemon. Uh, just a really efficient uh, one prize attacking uh, Pokemon. And that's been a big element of the success of a number of decks. We're seeing Beedrill. We're seeing Galarian Moltres. We're seeing uh, Malamar, just an archetype in general. We're seeing Meloetta. All of these one prizes, they are bit plot players in decks, but they are huge at um, changing up a prize race. Absolutely. Just seeing cards, I said this a lot yesterday, seeing cards like Beedrill being relevant, I adore all that. It's a kind of stage two where people look at it and they're like, oh, it's really good, but it's a stage two. We hear this a lot in Pokemon. You know, stage twos are awkward to get into play. So, you know, it's a really good attack, but it's a stage two. But then that single threat mustard supporter card comes out and actually it doesn't matter. It's not an issue because you can bring it out straight away. And certainly, and this is the difference, if you're the kind of player, and it's a mixture of deck building and sequencing, you've got to build a deck that can get that turn one B drill, and you've got to be able to work through your turn 
in the right order to get it. When you can do that three games in a row, that's not a fluke. You no. know, there's no way that Arna just happened to have the perfect hand three games in a row. That is a player who has played so many games with that deck that yeah. they can look at pretty much any hand and go, this is how I get to be drill. Yeah, and, and the Mew is really that unsung hero from Celebrations. It's a far cry from the likes of Stellarwish Jirachi that was in all sorts of decks, but we've just hit that break point where now there's four Quick Ball and four Ultra Ball. There's enough targets when you're Mysterious Tailing for six that it can give you enough value in those openings. Either it's establishing that uh, Arceus V down early for you, or it's just hand thinning for that Mustard. It does just enough for you that it's a, a really vital uh, pivot for you to have in the deck, and it's always a great thing when you don't have any natural free treaters or if you're not playing a huge amount of scoop up nets with Inteleon that we see all the time it's a great